Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. I am a famous Broadway producer. <laughs> I'm kidding. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a professional-slash-international theatre critic who had the pleasure of seeing many shows on Broadway this year. While I am usually based in the UK covering all things London theatre, I visited New York for the very first time in my life back in March of this year. I went for two weeks, and then I had so much fun and saw so many great shows and met so many new friends that I had to go back in October for another two-week trip. I made vlogs of all of these, I made reviews of the shows that I saw while I was there, you can go and check all of that out here on my channel. But today, for the sake of clarity and to give me a chance to talk about some of the shows that I didn't talk about when I saw them on my trips, I am going to rank every show that I saw on Broadway. Now to be clear, that is just the Broadway shows. I'm not including anything that I saw off Broadway, anything that was a one night only concert, or anything that I saw regionally. Because I saw most of what I wanted to see on Broadway this year, there were a few plays that got away. Looking at you, Jar Jar's African hair braiding. Some nights I still lie awake thinking about Jessica Chastain slowly microwaving on stage at the Hudson Theatre in a play I didn't get to see. There are also the shows that closed prior to our first trip to New York this year. Shows like Beetlejuice and the Into the Woods revival. Then there are the shows that opened and closed in between our two trips, like Grey House or like the Britney musical Once Upon a One More Time. There are also the shows that have opened since I last came back from New York, like How to Dance in Ohio or the Spamalot revival. All of which is to say this is not an exhaustive list of what I think of every show that was on Broadway this year, just the ones that I managed to see. 22 Broadway shows, and if I didn't have the playbills to prove it, then I could find out by going on ShowScore. So ShowScore is a website that's part of the to Datix family and it allows you to score and review all of the shows that you saw in London or New York. This does also include Off-Broadway Theatre and this month they are doing their own version of Spotify Wrapped, where you can tick all the shows that you saw this year and if you've already been scoring them as a show score user for free then they will already be ticked off for you. And then just like Spotify Wrapped they will give you fun shareable infographics and statistics telling you how many minutes you spent in a theatre, what your theatre going habits said about you as a person. It's super fun, it barely takes five minutes, and if you complete it using the link in the description, you will also be entered for a chance to win a £365 or $365 theatre token from Today Tix, which, as I've said before, could buy you a bunch of great nights out in the West End or one really great night on Broadway. You could maybe stretch it to a couple of Broadway shows if you're savvy, and you can take a friend with you as well, unless it's to see Merrily We Roll Along, in which case you can just have a great night by yourself, which I'm not against. Honestly, if it's a choice between between friendship or seeing this Merrily We Roll Along revival, then uh, I would choose the Merrily revival, which is utterly missing the message of the show, but it's that good. It's that good, everyone. Anyway, my point is, feel free to pause this video and click on the link in the description, sign up for a show score account while you're there. It's free, it's super fun, it means you can score all of the shows that you have been to see, and again, you could win a theatre voucher. How fun is that? But back to today's video, if you enjoy this one and you're curious about what I think of the shows I will hopefully get to see on Broadway and in the West End, and next year, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. You can also follow me on other social media platforms. I am at Mickey Joe Theatre on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Threads, and the app formerly known as Twitter. For now, let's find out what playbills I have in this pile. We're going to start with my favourite show, and then I think it's a little bit easier to work backwards towards the show that disappointed me the most on Broadway this year, so you will have to stay tuned to find out what that is. Let's count down from number one to number 22. Here we go. So I didn't plan for this when I was doing that introduction right now, but right on top of this playbill pile, my number one Broadway show of the year is Merrily We Roll Along, which came as little surprise to me. Fun fact, if you didn't know, this revival actually originated in London just over a decade ago at the Menier Chocolate Factory, it transferred to the West End, and then 10 years later it has finally made it to New York. It is a brilliant piece of direction by Maria Friedman that takes this formerly perhaps broken show, this show that no one had ever really been able to fix and make work, and it delivers what I think is almost a very perfect production. It's also sublimely cast. Jonathan Groff, Daniel Radcliffe, and Lindsay Mendez play off each other so well, they so believably feel like the oldest friends in the world, which is important for the show. 
Can you see the word friends here or can you, does it just look like I'm wearing a pullover that says old? This is top tier Sondheim, which is just about the best thing that there is. My personal favorite, Merrily We Roll Along, is probably one of my top 10 musicals of all time. I've always had tremendous fondness for it, I think. Almost the entire human experience, and especially as an artist, is all contained somewhere within this show. The cleverness of the writing, the emotional potency of it, the drama, it's perfect. It is just perfect. So, Merrily We Roll Along, the best thing I saw on Broadway this year. But which show was number two? Now, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that this is every bit as sophisticated and intellectual and moving as Merrily We Roll Along, but this is a great show nailing exactly what it is that it's trying to do. I am so sad that it is closing this month at the Nederlander Theatre on Broadway. I live in hope that it will go on to have a future life somewhere else, but I also think it's going to have a fantastic regional life around the US and then internationally. I, I have a lot of belief in this show. For those of you who don't know, and you can go and watch my full review about this, this is a musical about corn and the fictional town of Cobb County, a community where the only thing more important than corn is family. We see relationships being tested, but the really winning thing about the show is the way that it combines all of these utterly corny jokes and puns in the script with a legitimately great country soundtrack. It featured the rightfully Tony Award winning performance of Alex Newell, who stopped the show twice, both times that I saw it on Broadway this year with the song Independently Owned, which may also be one of the songs of 2023 on Broadway. This show grabbed my heart and made my heart on a cob with lots of other hearts beating in a sort of strange cob-like fashion. I'm gonna tell you about the next show now. So number three is a show that spoke to me critically and this was the revival of Parade. I was so desperate to see this. We queued up and got rush tickets to this show, which was a fantastic experience. And the dual performances of Ben Platt and Michaela Diamond in these roles, the combined vocal and acting power of the two of them during the song This Is Not Over Yet, during all the wasted time, the energy that they brought to the stage, both utterly fantastic. It centers around the true story of a historic miscarriage of justice. It features a book by Alfred Urey and this incredible score from Jason Robert Brown, one of his best. Also a really sublime supporting cast, Alex Grayson and J. Armstrong Johnson, Paul Alexander Nolan, Sean Allen Krill, lots of men with three names. Howard McGillan, my gosh. But perhaps my favorite thing about this revival was the, again, rightfully Tony Award winning direction by Michael Arden. The attention to detail, the emotional intensity, of it all. The way that this staging, which began life as a concert version of the show at New York City Center Encores and featured this central podium with chairs on either side, the way that that still had this immediacy and vitality and all of the little details with the balloon and with Mary Fagan and all of the imagery that was used and this rising chandelier, it got so many really striking moments. The projections on the back wall are compellingly well staged revival. Just wonderful. Just absolute musical theatre brilliance. Now we begin with some really, really high up four star shows. Starting with last season's Tony Award winner for best musical, Kimberly Akimbo. So Kimberly Akimbo, which is based on the play of the same name by David Lindsay Abair, has been adapted into a musical by him and his previous collaborator, Janine Tesori, who has written the score. And the show follows Kimberly, a teenager with a rare genetic disorder that has caused her body to prematurely age, making her look much older than she is. And she is played on stage by veteran Tony Award winning actress, Victoria Clark. Victoria's performance is radiant and heartbreaking in this show. I think the moment she wins a Tony Award, happens when all of her young friends are talking about what their lives are going to go on to be, sort of thoughtlessly and with little regard for the fact that Kimberly can't look forward to the same kind of a future because of her different life expectancy. It's a heartbreaking scene and she says nothing, but her face is telling us everything. Janine Tesori understands that as well because there is this quality and this character in the score throughout where we are feigning this levity and it's buoyant and it's humorous, but there is an absolute sadness and pain beneath it all. Songs like Father Time are masking and concealing this very difficult emotion. That's performed beautifully by Ali Morsey, who I think is one of the underappreciated gems of this show. But we also have to talk about the fantastic Justin Cooley and Bonnie Milligan. Again, won a Tony Award, rightfully so. The only reason that this slips from a five-star to a four-star review for me 
me is the staging. And while I am hugely impressed by the onstage ice skating that they do, I feel like the rest of the staging is a little bit incidental and it lacks a strong visual language like a show like Come From Away has, for example. I feel like you could produce another version of this musical that might even be a little stronger for a slightly better set design and direction. Okay, next, a show that I acknowledge has its limitations and its slight shortcomings, but I just loved it. I went back to see this show a week after first seeing it, less than a week after first seeing it, which is basically unheard of wherever I am in the world. I enjoyed it that much. It was Here Lies Love. I am devastated that this recently closed on Broadway. I was so hopeful that this would find an audience. If I was still in New York, I would be going to this every week just to go and party on the dance floor. This is the story of the controversial former leader of the Philippines, Marcos, and his wife, Imelda, as well as their political opponent, Ninoy Aquino. The show has been in development for a very long time. It's been written by David Byrne and Fatboy Slim and directed by Alex Timbers. And it has this incredibly unique staging where we have a dance floor area on the converted stage of the Broadway theatre. They have taken out the entire orchestra so that audiences can stand among these moving platforms upon which the show is performed. Or you can sit in the mezzanine or other new areas of the theatre. It's an incredible set design by David Corrins. The space was called Club Millennium and it was using Filipino culture and the idea of karaoke, a Filipino invention, in order to tell this story from the Philippines, which I think is very clever. And there are many shows that do this for discernibly no reason. And this show had a connection to the reason why it was being staged that way. I also think all of the songs were infectiously fun. Conrad Ricamora better get nominated for a Tony Award for his performance as Ninoy. I thought he was fantastic. Again, you can go and watch my full review for my many thoughts on this show because there are ways in which it could have been improved. I want it to be a little bit more politically potent. I want it to have dialogue. I want it to be fuller, but I think it's difficult asking an audience involving many tourists to come back for a second act and continue standing on the dance floor. I think that's what restricted it to a one act show when really I could have had another hour of this easily. A deceptively clever show and just about the most fun that I had on Broadway. R.I.P. Here Lies Love. I loved you. Next up is a show that I didn't enjoy as much when I first saw it in London, but when I saw it on Broadway, I finally got what all the hype had been about. I am talking about Hades Town. So for sure, a fan favorite musical. This is a show written by musician Aeneas Mitchell. It's based on ancient Greek myth involving the characters of Orpheus and Eurydice, but also this subplot involving Hades and Persephone. And the score has this ethereal and timeless quality that manages to tell this ancient story with a sort of a contemporary feel. I saw the show back in March while Reeve Carney and Ivan Oblazada were still in the show. I thought she was incredible. He sounded vocally fantastic, but the acting performance that she was giving, just pouring her heart out on the stage of the Walter Kerr Theater. I think the theater itself and the way it sits in that space was a big component of why I enjoyed the show more on Broadway. The atmosphere and the feel of it all made a lot more sense than the Olivier Auditorium at the National Theatre where I first saw the show, which didn't really work for it. I will be very intrigued to see how this show plays to a West End audience when it opens in February at the Lyric Theatre in London. I am already very excited about the cast, but Hades Town is a show for me that manages to capture a tone few other things do really well. It has this richness, it's somber, it's dark, but hopeful in spite of itself. It's also mournful, and I think it offers audiences catharsis, particularly emerging from the pandemic. If audiences wanted something purely uplifting and escapism, then this is not quite that. This is maybe therapy on stage. Next up, as we continue through four star shows that I really enjoyed, but had little bits of areas for improvement, we have the revival of Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. And I enjoyed Josh Groban's performance. I thought he was an interesting, slightly more romantic take on Sweeney. He felt like the kind of naive and optimistic young man man, which is there in the lyrics actually about his naivety, whose resolve had been hardened and whose personality had been affected by the dark things that had happened to him in his past. Annalie Ashford, meanwhile, is barely playing a human being in this show and it worked for me. I thought she was 
a riot. And perhaps it's only because I've seen a bunch of Mrs. Lovett's before. I'm very open to someone doing something boldly new with the role. I have heard the criticism online about her English accent. And as an English person in that audience, I, I know it was not perfect. It sounded a little bit Gemma Collins-esque to me when she called him Mr. Todd. The performances I did completely love, Ruthie Ann Miles as the beggar woman who was giving you multiple great accents and this wholly committed, maddened characterization. Gaten Matarazzo as Toby, I thought was overlooked by the Tony Awards because I thought he was lovely. His scene with Annalie brought out the best in her performance as well because she had this truth and this honesty and this vulnerability in that moment that had been lacking earlier on. There were some really striking creative features of this production, in particular the lighting design. My goodness, this lighting design. I still think about that moment in Epiphany when Josh Groban as Sweeney is lit from the front, casting an enormous shadow on this very, very tall back wall of the stage. The onstage crane I found a little bit more puzzling, simply because I don't think it was used to tremendously great effect. The bridge that rose up and down created more sightline problems and more distance from the audience than it provided much to the show. So in some ways this was a little bit of a disappointment because I did think it was a stellar creative team that could have given us a near perfect version of Sweeney Todd and what we ended up with is this dark and rewarding and creative and satisfying version of Sweeney Todd that isn't quite perfect. Next up we had a show with perhaps flawed material but at least one fantastic performance. I am talking about the highly discussed revival of Funny Girl starring Leah Michelle. But this is another one I have discussed at length. You can go and see my full review. I think the material inherently doesn't quite work. I think it's also inextricably linked to Barbara Streisand, so it will always invite that comparison. And for this show to be successful, you're almost having to cast someone as Barbara, as Fanny Bryce, rather than just casting someone who's going to find something new in Fanny Bryce, which is what they initially tried to do when they cast Beanie Feldstein in this revival. When Leah Michelle was brought in to replace her, however, slightly controversially, not only did she manage to turn around the show's box office, but she was met with more critical praise. Because even though the show is called Funny Girl, one of the real metrics for its success is the ability of the leading actress to really knock these songs out of the park and knock them out of the park, she did. Leah Michelle gave a fantastic, powerful vocal performance. I saw the show on Jonathan Groff's birthday, so she was really giving it some that day. But I was also surprised by her acting choices and the moments at which she let the vocal kind of take the back seat to a powerful acting moment. That wasn't something that I expected from her. I also thought that she was charmingly funny, if not hilarious. Jared Grimes gave us this sensational scene-stealing tap dance moment. Ramin Karimlu, I really enjoyed as Nick Arnstein. I enjoyed their moments together. Their duet in the second act was probably my favorite moment of the show. But despite a clever set with this revolving central section that kept everything moving and an earnest attempt at fixing it from Michael Mayer, I do think that this show is perhaps irretrievably flawed. But again, for more of my thoughts, you can go and watch my full video review. Because of Leah Michelle's performance, this was still a four-star show. Next, we have a couple of longer running shows that I saw on Broadway, ranked here, not because I think that they are less good than the shows that came above them, but just because of how much I enjoyed them when I went to see them. An enjoyment level which had to contend with me already knowing what the show was, so they didn't really have that element of surprise, if that makes sense. But first up, we have Wicked. And I was delighted to finally get to see this at the Gershwin Theatre. I do think that this is the definitive version of this production. We have Flying Monkeys flying around the auditorium, which is something they should be doing everywhere. When I went to Brazil this year, I saw the non-replica version of Wicked where Elphaba actually flies out into the audience. And there's really nothing that the Broadway production can do to beat that because that is a fantastic effect. But there is also, and you're gonna laugh at me for caring so much about this, but there is a trap door in Defying Gravity. And so from the beginning of the scene, they enter through this trap door, which makes sense because they're going up into the attic. And it's the tiniest little difference because we don't have that trap door in the West End production but my mind was blown when they entered through this trapdoor. I was like, they're coming on stage through a trapdoor because they're in the attic. And then when Alpha needs to jam the door shut to prevent the guards from bursting in who are chasing them, she, used, she grabs a broom, the broom that becomes her broomstick, and she jams that into the trap door hole. Jam, I hope you're happy. Jam, I hope you're happy now. Jam, I hope you're happy how you've hurt your cause forever. I hope you think you're clever. And that particular direction choice 
thrilling to me, utterly thrilling. I love that I can still be noticing things that Joe Mantello did with this direction years later. I saw Alyssa Fox and Mackenzie Kurtz as Alphaba and Glinda. Alyssa sounded fantastic. Mackenzie, the characterization that she brought to Glinda. American Glinda's are in general more fun, I think, than British Glinda's because they don't have to play quite so prim and proper. They can be more wild and comedic and outrageous. I really enjoyed her popular, all of the choices made there. I had a great time. It was wicked. It was wicked on Broadway. How can you not love it? Then right behind that, I also had a really great time at <gasps> six, which by this point I had seen 20 plus times in multiple different countries. So again, thrilled to tick Broadway off that list. And I know from back in the day that when six first headed to the States, people were thrown by them using American accents for a show about historical British characters. If you don't know, this is the story of the six wives of Henry VIII who are reconceived as a very contemporary sounding and feeling pop ensemble. It certainly has an appeal to younger audiences. It's a very accessible narrative because it's very light on narrative, but it's a deceptively clever show. It's been written by rising musical theatre stars, Toby Marlowe and Lucy Moss. And beneath this winning but seemingly basic premise, we have this clever creeping idea of what the show is actually trying to tell you. There's a message behind the message which emerges at the end. It also, and I know it's not completely historically accurate and occasionally trivializes a few things in the name of entertainment, but it also uplifts the historical characters which it is portraying and offers them the opportunity to reclaim their own history in light of the persecution and abuse and murder that they experienced. Loved all the queens that I saw on Broadway. Holly Conway was playing Catherine of Aragon, who is one of the show's alternates, and gave one of my favorite Catherine of Aragon performances I have ever seen. This is another one that I think Americans might just be able to do better because the whole basis for this role is Beyonce, right? And how well you can deliver Deliver a Beyonce kind of a performance. You have this indignation of a wife whose husband is having an affair and trying to divorce her and send her to go and live in a nunnery while singing this fast but challenging Beyonce style song. And an arrogant that can really set the bar with no way opens us up for a great show. And that is exactly what she did. The whole cast, absolutely fantastic. I loved Six, I'm always gonna love Six and I loved it on Broadway. Then we had another British show on Broadway, but this time performed by its British cast. I am talking about Peter Pan Goes Wrong. So this show has just made a seasonal return back to London at the Lyric Theatre in the West End, but earlier this year it was on Broadway at the Ethel Barrymore Theatre, with several of the original cast members of the Mischief Theatre Company performing in the show. Peter Pan Goes Wrong is a follow-up to the very popular play that goes wrong, and it's about this fictional drama group who are trying to stage a production of Peter Pan, but as the title suggests, things go wrong. It's full of hilarious building slapstick comedy. They play on the little characterizations that they have developed throughout these shows. And the attention to detail is truly winning. Before the show starts, you have Chris Leesk as the stage manager running around and like lifting cables over people's heads. You have chaos in the auditorium before it even begins. They give you this little program insert inside the playbill, which is just hilarious. There's an in memoriam for the crocodile they were planning to bring to Broadway, which is, which is not real if anyone's concerned, but just hilarious performances in particular Harry Kershaw and Charlie Russell and Nancy Zamet. So funny, so, so funny in this show. There's even a little bit of a romantic subplot. What I really love about these shows is the way that they build with uh, these characters and we can see other things brewing while they're trying to stage these productions. I love the way that they commit to these jokes that just layer on top of each other and keep coming back in a bigger and bigger way so that we see things happening as an audience and we know what's going to come next. It all builds towards this climactic final sequence where we have this stage, which is on a revolve, spinning wildly out of control as the characters lovably just try and commit to still doing the show when they really ought to give up. It's a charming show, it's a very funny show. It's not my favorite of the goes wrongs, but you can't go wrong as an audience member with these plays. They are all just brilliant. Then we had another play from my more recent trip, Pearly Victorious. This is a revival of the Ossie Davis play directed by Kenny Leon, starring Leslie Odom Jr. Set in the cotton plantation country of the Old South, 
it is about the character of Pearly, who returns to try and reclaim the land that is owed to him. But this was a wonderful, dynamic, and engaging piece of theater, sometimes comic, sometimes darkly comic, satirizing slavery and post-slavery, the absolute highlight of which, alongside Leslie Odom Jr.'s indefatigably energized performance, as Pearly was Kara Young's supporting performance. She was brilliant and should be nominated for and win a Tony Award for this because it was one of those real standout, stunning star performances. She plays Lutie Bell and she is so enamored with Reverend Pearly that she agrees to be a part of his plot to try and win back his inheritance and take back control of his church but her anxious tendencies may prove slightly challenging. I really enjoyed this. This audience was engaged and enthusiastic and responsive, which was really fun to be a part of that energy. I liked the set as well. It did this slightly frustrating thing of revealing this incredible set right at the end of the play. It also, I believe, ran without an intermission, despite there being a really great opportunity for an intermission to be. I think for my money, it could also have been a shade more theatrical. It's this satirical approach to this story rather than going for an earnest realism. And if some moments of it had been a little bit more heightened, then the gravity of its reality in other moments would have been felt a little more acutely, perhaps. Next up, back to musical theater, we had another UK to US transfer, this time the musical and Juliet. So it took me a little while to see this on Broadway because I didn't initially feel as though I had to. I'd seen it a bunch of times in the UK and there was nothing hugely different, although like Six, this is another one where the cast are performing it using American accents, even though they are playing Shakespeare and Shakespearean era British characters. But for some of them, I thought that maybe even worked a little bit better. I made a review video about this where I suggested that Anne Juliet might even have been better on Broadway. I enjoyed it more. The show follows Shakespeare's Juliet of Romeo and Juliet, and it imagines the life that she could have gone on to lead had she not killed herself at the end of the play. Basically, Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway, is weighing in and rewriting his play for him. But it combines this fun modern book by David West Reed with the discography of Max Martin, who is the hit maker behind so many great pop songs, a lot of Britney's songs, a lot of Backstreet Boys, Katy Perry, Ariana Grande. And some of these performers, in particular, Lorna Courtney as Juliet, Philip Arroyo as, 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 what's his name? The guy, he's the guy with it. Frankie, Francois, Francois Dubois. Also Austin Scott as Shakespeare. Maybe the best performers that I've seen in those roles. Maybe my favorite interpretations of those characters. We also got to see Melanie LeBarry as the nurse. She is leaving the show at the end of this year to come back to the UK to play Hermes in Hadestown, but thrilled to get to see her in that role again because she's, she's just perfect. She is effing perfect, in fact. Things I love about this show, Luke Shepard's direction keeps it light, keeps everything moving, hits the emotional beats where it needs to, but it's just fun and it's youthful and it's exuberant. And I think that's a big component of why it has done so well on Broadway. It's a fun show to go and see. People can enjoy themselves at this. It also looks fantastic. Sutra Gilmore's set, brilliant. Paloma Young's costume design, I am in love with all of these costumes. I love them so much. They are gorgeous and stunning in the way that they combine the Shakespearean elements with these modern designs I think is mwah. Next up, maybe the most fun that I had at a play on Broadway was at Fat Ham. So continuing, I guess, with contemporary recontextualizations of Shakespeare, this is an interpretation of the Hamlet story. It's not a variant of Hamlet as a text. It really doesn't touch anything particularly Shakespearean, but it takes the idea of Hamlet of this son whose father has been killed, who he sees as a ghost, and demands that he avenge him, and it stages it at a family cookout. Which is as much fun as it sounds. This was a hilariously funny play. Another one with a late stage set revelation that was just mind-blowing. Chris Herbie Holland gave a hilarious supporting performance as this stoner character. Nikki Crawford was just wonderful as the mum, giving a slightly inappropriate karaoke performance of 100% pure love that is indelibly marked into my brain. But this show made me laugh, it made me gasp, it was shocking in places, it was just a lot of fun, which is something that plays can be, and something that I think more plays are 
in the US. I think we're very heavy and very serious and profound with our plays here in London. And I would welcome more theatre like this, where just because it isn't a musical doesn't mean it can't be fun and jubilant and joyous and an absolute riot, which is what this was. It also made me very hungry. I had to go and buy a lot of food after I saw this play. Next up was Gutenberg. This is another show that I reviewed with a full review video here on YouTube. This is the Broadway arrival of a show that was actually written around about two decades ago. And it reunites Book of Mormon stars Andrew Reynolds and Josh Gad, who have also got on to become huge stars since the Book of Mormon. They star as Bud and Doug in the two-person musical Gutenberg, in which Bud and Doug are writers pitching their slightly bizarre Broadway musical about Gutenberg, the creator of the printing press, to an audience of investors and producers. They perform the show themselves and they transform into the many different characters of the show by wearing different hats with different names written on them, like the one that I bought from the show. The show that they're actually pitching is meant to be comically bad. It feels not unlike a Star Kid musical because of its sense of humor. It is historical fiction, I believe is what they call it, uh, based on the fact that they tried to research this character and couldn't find out much about him, so made up a plot about his life. And it's a very funny evening, but it's funny because of the strength of these two performers. They absolutely elevate this material with their brilliant rapport and with their comedic ease. There are so many moments where Josh Gad gets a huge laugh simply for repeating something slowly or simply for a noise or a reaction. The show was written by Scott Brown and Anthony King, and I don't think it's necessarily the most consequential material. It's not a cast recording that I am crying out for, but it's a fun evening at the theater, especially especially if you are a fan of either of these two performers, because they are really what sell the thing. Next up, what has happened to this playbill? I have no idea what's happened here, but the next show we have is Some Like It Hot. This is another show that has sadly announced its closure at the end of this year, but it is planning to head over to the West End, which was not news that came as a surprise to me. Back in March, we said that this was probably the show we could most easily see transferring to London and would go down well with British audiences. It's based on the classic Marilyn Monroe film, but it does a lot to try and update that to a more contemporary audience, because we are getting more than a little bit fatigued of these many recent shows that play on the trope of a man cross-dressing in women's clothing and that being the source of laughter. Some Like It Hot has a much better approach to that, I think, because it doesn't use that as a comedic tool. We have these two characters played by J. Harrison G. and Christian Borel, who pretend to be women in order to escape from like the mob who are chasing them. J. Harrison G.'s character Daphne has a little bit of a revelation around their gender identity. J., who is a non-binary performer, does a beautiful job of playing this role with honesty and truth. And Daphne has a song in the second act called You Could Have Knocked Me Over With A Feather, which is one of these standout moments of the show. In fact, it's part of a run of three or four songs in a row, beginning with Let's Be Bad, which has been borrowed from the TV show Smash, the music for this having been written by that same composing team, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman. And there's a lot of nice enough jazzy tunes in this that are serviceable and get the job done, but they're not my favorites. I affectionately refer to this show as some like it lukewarm because I don't think it's the most scintillating or thrilling thing. It features good performances. It has great choreography from director Casey Nicolor, that tap dance chase sequence in the second act is genius. Adriana Hicks sounds phenomenal and brings an awful lot of heart to her performance. I don't think this is Christian Borel at his comedic best. He feels a little bit inhibited here, like he's giving deference to J. Harrison G., and perhaps rightfully so. Kevin Delaguilar, when he appears in the second act, has a really charming romantic subplot. But all in all, an easy watch, a nice enough show, something I would love to revisit in a future production, but it didn't knock my socks off. Then just behind that, we have our next play, The Cottage. So this was the first show that I saw on my recent trip in October after we landed, and we landed during this like biblical rainstorm. I will say this is kind of the perfect show to see with 
jet lag because you don't need to work too hard thinking about it. It's light and fluffy and comedic. It feels a little bit like a parody of classic movies and plays. It has a little bit of the Noel Coward to it. It has an all-star cast who use these kind of mock deliberately comically dreadful British accents, which some of them apologized personally to us for afterwards. But I said it was fine. It was perfect. It's the whole point of the show. Eric McCormack was charming as this philanderer. Laura Bell Bundy was rapturously wonderful as his emancipated wife. Dana Steingold stole the whole thing for me with her crazy zany characterization. There was one line reading I still think about and I quote constantly and Aaron has been telling me I keep copying this intonation with other things that I'm saying because she tells them about her very intimidating husband who is going to come looking for her and he's this big threatening man and when he arrives he is not quite what they have been anticipating. And they say to her, you told us he was a big man. And she replied, he's bigger than me, being this tiny little woman. And that just that line reading alone should earn her a Tony Award nomination. I will be advocating for Dana Steingold getting a Tony nom for The Cottage. But for the most part, it probably went on for longer than it needed to as well. I don't know that the second act really brought anything new. You kind of knew by the end of the first act exactly where everything was going to go, and then it did. The one thing I do want to say about this production, the incredible set design by Paul Tate Dupu III, we actually got to stand on this set after the show and see it in all of its detail, this fantastic house that they had created with all of these walls, with all of this detail, with all of various places to pull cigarettes from and stash them. Just gorgeous. One of those really great Broadway sets that you just want to live in. Next up, a show that I unbelievably had not seen until a few months ago, Aladdin. And I shan't lie, a big component of going to see this show a couple months ago was to see the New Amsterdam Theatre, this historic and gorgeous theatre where it is, my goodness, this auditorium just stunning, absolutely incredible. One of the most beautiful theatres I think I've ever seen. I actually enjoyed myself more than I thought I was going to at Aladdin because I had set my expectations lower. And for sure, there are a lot of parts of it where it doesn't really stand up to the quality of some of their other shows. I think the structure of the show where we have to wait until the end of the first act to get the genie, it's a huge payoff when we do with Friend Like Me, which is this fantastic number. But it means we have this bloated first act where we're just delaying that happening and so you just have so much exposition leading up to that point and then we end up racing through the second act plot and everything ties itself up just a little bit too neatly and Jasmine's character which has been very strongly established in the first act kind of then takes a step backwards we have these side characters of Omar, Kasim, and uh, Babkak that's the other one they're ultimately pointless and don't really do anything. When they have a song in the second act, we know that we're just killing time. A Whole New World is a really magical visual sequence, but the cutting of multiple animal characters does feel like a lazy choice from Disney, who have managed to bring other animal characters like Sven in Frozen to life really well, like the fact that we humanize Iago and we cut Abu and we cut Raja. That just feels a little lazy. But the performances I very much enjoyed. It sounded great. I enjoy all of the music in this. I even enjoy the new music that has been added to the show and that has been uh, brought out from the Disney vault. Michael James Scott bringing consistent energy as the genie, but my favorite, Don Daryl Rivera as Iago. So funny, so scene-stealingly funny. Is it my favorite show on Broadway? No. Is it my favorite show that Disney have ever put on stage? No, but I enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to. So if you're someone who has been resisting Aladdin, perhaps go and give it a chance. I will also say the ushers at the new Amsterdam theater should be like running the police because my gosh. Next up, another long-running Broadway show that I decided to finally tick off was Chicago. This was actually the very first show that I saw on Broadway, and we went to go and see it because Jinx Monsoon was starring as Matron Mama Morton. Chicago, which started its life as a revival of the show in concert at New York City Center Encores and was smartly recognized by producers as a financially viable way of running the show on Broadway, has become synonymous with a certain amount of stunt casting. That is where celebrities are brought in to play roles in the show. This is about to happen again in January because Bravo's Vanderpump Rules star Ariana Maddox will be joining the show as Roxy Hart. Now, I really enjoyed Jinx in this. Jinx Monsoon is perfect for musical theatre. The audience loved her as Matron Mama Morton, her performance of When You're Good to Mama, and also the song Class and the little 
comic line readings that she put in to that and the new comedy moments that she found in what is not normally a comedy song. Genius, brilliant, wonderful. I enjoy that she wasn't playing it as Jinx Monsoon, that she was really playing it as a character. She was giving us this kind of a very different huskier accent, which I enjoyed. The vocal was fab, she looked brilliant. She really fit in very well with the rest of the cast. But the show otherwise can begin to feel just a little bit tired in places. And if you're a fan of the movie and that kind of dramatic intensity and passion that it has, something like the stage version of the Cell Block Tango, where it almost feels like the female ensemble are playing it for laughs and giving you these campy interpretations of those dramatic speeches might take you by surprise. And I still think that this is a great way to stage Chicago. I love the design of it. I love having that band on stage. There's still a lot of cleverness with the staging, the way we use those ladders, the moments where people slide down the side of the set, that introductory, all that jazz is still one of the best and most thrilling openings on Broadway, I just think that the show is definitely showing its age in other areas, and it's not the most thrilling night that you could have in the theatre. Next up, we find ourselves in low three-star territory here when I tell you about the Broadway production of Moulin Rouge. Now, I have seen Moulin Rouge twice on Broadway this year, and on both occasions, it was, it was not immediately planned, but it ended up happening because of casting. We went in March because Aaron Tveit had gone back into the show and it was a chance to see his Tony Award winning performance. We went again in October to try and see Titus Burgess. We went on his second night as Harold Zidler and he was not in the show. He had performed the first night and he was out for the second. And listen, injuries happen and health things happened. I, I, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a COVID thing and he had to be out of the show, whatever. And it's disappointing as an audience member when that is exclusively the reason that you have gone back to see that show. But also his understudy that night was probably my favorite person in that cast. And though I have enjoyed Moulin Rouge more and more each time I've seen it in London, I have been consistently disappointed when I've seen it on Broadway. There have always been a couple of performers who have been giving low energy performances controversially, and I'm willing to expand on this in a fuller video because this is a bomb of a statement for me to be dropping right now. I did not like Aaron Tveit that much. It kind of felt like he was sleepwalking through the midweek matinee performance that we saw. And he clearly really enjoys performing that Roxanne moment because that was great and everybody loved that. But outside of that, I didn't get the wide-eyed passion and love that you need to have from a Christian. They need to bring that energy and that or for you to believe their adoration of Satine. And that is something on which the entire show is built. I also haven't been convinced that they've really been getting the casting of Satine on Broadway right. When I saw Courtney Reed on this most recent visit, she hit all of the comedy beats, which is not something I expect from a Satine. She didn't attempt a British accent, which honestly was probably for the best because some of the British accents I heard the first time around were dubious, but I didn't really feel the heartbreak. Both times this has felt like a show that is stylish and glamorous. It's just been lacking something of a soul at its center. And so I've been left disappointed both times I saw it on Broadway, despite loving the same show in London. So that brings us to our last two shows at the bottom of this list. Which one was my biggest disappointment? Well, it may surprise you to learn it wasn't this one, because this is next. Of course, we have to talk about Bad Cinderella. So what else to say about this show? This is the latest musical from Andrew Lloyd Webber, which began its life in London simply as Cinderella, and had a pretty warm reception from the critics, but was short-lived. Due to low ticket sales, it closed amidst controversy. It transferred to Broadway and then opened amidst controversy. It was retitled Bad Cinderella, for better or worse, which did arm New York's critics with a lot of ammunition when they gave the show scathing reviews. And if you've been a viewer of my channel for a while, then you know I have talked about this show an awful lot. And this is really the show that necessitated my trip to Broadway. I would always have gone to Broadway at some point, but the exact timing of it was all about the opening of Bad Cinderella. I got to see the show's final preview performance before opening. I got to stand outside the theater and watch the celebrities going in on opening night. And I made a full review video here on my channel talking about the show on Broadway and what I thought, but my overall takeaway was that it was fine. It's just bland. I don't think the score is the biggest problem. I think the show's biggest problem ultimately has always been it doesn't know what it is trying to be. It's trying to be too many things to too many 
many different people? Is it for families? Is it risque? It's not quite as funny as it wants to be. It's visually stunning and very stylish, but the costume design got a little bit confused when it headed to Broadway because we got less of a pronounced difference between the ensemble and Cinderella, which is the entire thing that the show is built around. There are still gaping plot holes. It still claims to be this feminist reworking of the show where every single female character hates every other single female character. Like there is not one positive relationship between two women in this show. And in fact, in general, it did lose its way a little bit in the journey from London to Broadway and got slightly worse. There are some great songs. There were some great performances. I really enjoyed Jordan Dobson on Broadway. There were some fun campy moments between Grace McLean and Carolee Carmelo, who is a goddess. But I didn't laugh much. I wasn't particularly moved. This really just didn't do much for me. However, not the worst thing I saw on Broadway. You may have expected this show to be at the bottom of my list, but that is saved for this last entrant. New York, New York. So this show really ought to have been a whole lot better than it was. It had this prestigious creative team, it had great producers attached to it, and a huge amount of money had been invested in putting this together. This is a stage musical adaptation, kind of, of the film of the same name, starring Robert De Niro and Liza Minnelli, the most memorable part of which is the title song, New York, New York, which of course has gone on to have a huge life of its own. I had high hopes going into this. I booked this as our last show of our first and what was then planning to be our only New York trip of the year. I was like, this is the perfect way to say goodbye to New York. And it is in many ways a love letter to the city and features these lovely sort of vignette homages to New York. And I didn't hate this entirely. It's probably a two-star show and it gets those two stars for its two leading stars, Colton Ryan and Anna Ozeli. She sounded phenomenal singing The World Goes Round and singing New York, New York. It had some striking coup de theatre moments. Not only the moment you may have heard about where the entire orchestra pit rises up onto the stage level and then she steps forwards onto that to perform the song New York, New York. I do think it misses choreography at that moment. And again, in the curtain call, I said this before, I, th I think you just need a kick line. I know that that's what the Rockettes do, but to me, perhaps to my basic interpretation of this, you can't have the end of that song without a kick line. It's up to you, kick, new kick, York, kick, new kick, jump, kick, da -da -da. jump, kick, jump, kick. We had another coup de theater moment where we had this sunrise effect, some really strong lighting and some very powerful visuals but the plot had so many holes in it may as well have been a colander. I loved, loved, loved Colton Ryan's performance. I thought he was wonderful as our central character, whether or not he was an alcoholic, whether or not he had depth. He led the whole thing with enough charisma that he managed to sell me on it. Their relationship was back and forth constantly. It was one of those frustrating romantic plot points that could be very easily resolved if the two of them were just to have a conversation about it. They have announced that there is plans for this show to tour and with that massive a set design and with it being about New York that is a little puzzling to me but time will tell we will see what happens with New York New York it's a show I think is fixable but it needs heavy extensive rewrites but that is the end those have been the shows that I saw on Broadway this year ranked and I am so curious to hear your thoughts in the comments section down below do you agree with all of my choices and more importantly what were your favorite and most disappointing shows seen on Broadway this year and if you want to find out how many shows you saw on Broadway this year, click on the link in the description, go to Show Scores Year in Reviews, and remember, if you complete the process, you can win a $365 or £365 Today Takes gift card. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you've enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel so you don't miss any of my reviews coming next year. Hopefully, more Broadway shows. Watch this space. For now, I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For ten more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>